All right, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I am Conrad Stump with the Springfield Green County Library in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we are so pleased to be joined by New York Times bestselling author Daniel Krauss. His books include Rotters, which was a 2019 Summer Scare selection, Bent Heavens, and The Death and Life of Zebulon Finch. Uh, with Guillermo del Toro, he co-wrote Tro Troll Hunters and The Shape of Water, and with the late George A. Romero, uh, The Living Dead, which we are here to talk about tonight. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Krauss. Welcome. Hello, people. <laughs> Live and on tape. How are you? That's right. <laughs> so you have this, you have kind of a long relationship with Romero's work. You came to it pretty early. Can you tell us a bit about your first encounter with it and how you sort of began to explore it more? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I saw Night of the Living Dead uh, very young. It's the first movie I remember seeing. Uh, I, I have no doubt that I saw other movies at some point. You know, <laughs> I imagine I saw. Disney movies or whatever. Yeah, Bambi was in there somewhere. <laughs> whatever it is, kids watch. I don't, I don't yeah. know what kids watch uh, <laughs> then or today, but apparently mm -hmm. kids like me watch Night of the Living Dead. So my mom was a big horror fan and uh, we would watch, the main things we would watch were Twilight Zones together. Nice. Um, but also because of the sort of famous copyright mistake for Night of the Living Dead, uh, made it public domain so it was mm -hmm. always on so that was the movie that um, I feel like we would watch at least a couple times a year because it would just pop up um, certainly around Halloween but also just other mm -hmm. times it would just pop up we'd watch it over the years um, and it you know just became my favorite movie really yeah and I think when you see it as a, a young kid in a movie like that um, well first of all I think as a kid you you can it's understandable like it might be a movie for adults, but like you understand the, the concept of the house being a safe place. And you understand, uh, well, some of us anyway, understand the concept of a sort of an extended family unit um, and the idea that there's sort of bad things outside. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, it also, you know, if I'm, if I'm a kid and I'm watching these um, Disney movies or whatever it was I was watching, they certainly didn't conclude like night living dead like it was it was a movie that taught me uh wow you can you can like kill all your main characters like you can do these things that just didn't really compute or you don't normally think of until much later you know when you're growing up so it was a movie that that really shaped me uh early and often you know it was it was yeah it was it, it really affected my whole life every part of yeah. my life um <laughs> mostly in positive ways i think <laughs> as far as you know right <laughs> so far so good yeah <laughs> so one thing i was really intrigued by was the sort of serendipitous um relationship that you had with or connection that you had with romero's manager chris rowe so mm -hmm. i'd love for you to kind of share that story um and how it ended up with you meeting romero yeah it's a, it's a weird story um so i grew up in this i grew up in iowa a small town and um uh i anyway i graduate and move on <laughs> and uh many years later i'm reading an article about george miro and i i noticed that it, it in the article the people writing it say thank you to chris rowe um and i think man there was there was a guy in high school that i knew chris rowe uh i wonder if there's any ch any chance this could be the same guy it seems highly unlikely uh but i i kind of googled it up and eventually got to the point where i was pretty sure that it was the same guy which seemed astronomically impossible like a little rural town uh -huh. <laughs> um to, to have two people sort of professionally involved in the arts within like a decade seemed uh odd so anyway i tracked him down and it turned out he was the same guy and he was a a talent manager and his you know biggest client was george Miro. and i said well and you know we we sort of knew each other in high school we weren't like super tight but he's a little older than me but glancingly sort of knew each other. Um, so I said, Let, well, let's get together. And he said, next time I'm in Chicago with George, I'll, I'll let you know. And uh, just a few months later, he was. And so he invited me to the um, hotel where they were. And, we, and I met George and I, we hung out for a while. 
Um, and it was great. It was, it was super great. And, and then that was kind of it, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, another decade passed and we were, we were sort of out of touch again. Um, yeah. And, and, and over that time, our careers developed, you know, I think Chris uh -huh. went on to become a, 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 an even more successful manager. And I went on to publish a whole bunch of books. Um, yeah, you've done all right for yourself. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, once those 10 years uh, had passed, you know, George died. Um, and then about a month later, I, Chris calls me up from out of the mm -hmm. blue um, and said, look, I'm with his, I'm with George's wife and we're, we're trying to think about what to do with this manuscript, this unfinished novel that George had been mm -hmm. working on for quite a while. Um, at that point, I had done both um, Game with those horror collaborations. So it was something I, I had sort of proven that I could kind of do. Mm -hmm. um, and so they asked me if I wanted to take a, a shot at it. And so I did. And that was the next uh, couple years of my life, the, the yeah. most exciting project <laughs> that I've ever worked on. I mean, George yeah. and Carol, is my origin story, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> so to, to be able to be part of the book that that essentially ends his mm -hmm. six film zombie saga, to be part of the thing that started me, felt um, like an incredible, strange yeah. gift, but responsibility too. Yeah, the world is a strange place sometimes and you know how it works and just like, I know the sky and, it resulted in this amazing thing that's kind of been, you know, something that I hadn't thought of, but this lifelong sort of fantasy. <laughs> yeah, almost. it's, it's, it's really weird. And I think now that, you know, the book has been out for however long it's been, mm -hmm. nine months or whatever. <laughs> um, and, you know, all the, the, the press from the hardcover edition, mm -hmm. um, has died down. Like I sort of like been able to sort of move on with my life, but for a long time, those couple of years, and then during all the last six months, it did it. It did never felt really real. It was too mm -hmm. weird, you know. It was too strange of a, a story. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about kind of how like the first, you know, the beginning stages of this process. Like what kind of state was Romero's work in when you came to it? Um. It's a it's a simple question and a complicated answer because uh, it, there was the manuscript. There was initial initial manuscript that um, that Chris and Suzanne uh, George's widow sent me, and that was a, a big chunk of pages, um, and that's what I that's what I worked with to begin with. That's where I began my sort of studying of um, all of his movies and his interviews and commentary tracks and. Uh, scholarly articles and long interviews with uh, Sue's herself. And I was basing it on that, that piece of the puzzle. But as kind of time went on, we found more pieces. There was a, there was another part where we found a hundred new pages that we, that ha had kind of been lost. Um, so that was an additional hundred pages. We found this short story that had been sort of lost to time. And it was, it was very, key because it, it went into the mind of a zombie, which we'd never had from George before. Um, and then his manager at some point found this nine pages of notes that told, gave me some better idea of where he was going with some of the stories. So at the, so at the end of that, we had, um, we had like what I like to think of as a bunch of islands of information. We had a chunk of the book here and a chunk over here and a chunk here. And part of my job was to to build bridges between mm -hmm. all the chunks, some of which were short bridges, some of which were, were long bridges and uh, figure out a way to make it all flow like it was it was planned that way from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the materials I used to build those bridges was just based on studying George himself as, mm -hmm. a, as a creator and as a thinker. Yeah, so that, I mean, right, Romero has this following, he's huge in horror, so influential, and so I'm curious how you sort of like got past the nerves that some might have of, you know, what the fans might think of someone else completing his work, you know, what was that sort of <laughs> thought yeah. process like? Well, I mean, I went into it assuming the worst, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> that that I, that it was a, a losing proposition, that if the book was really good everyone <laughs> would 
rightfully celebrate George. <laughs> the book was bad, everyone would blame me. Um, and that largely hasn't happened. This book has been embraced on a scale that I, I am shocked by. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the fans, his fans really have seemed to um, embrace it. So, but that's not an outcome that I had expected. And as far as me just sort of getting over the, the pressure of it, the pressure definitely didn't come from the Romero estate. Uh -huh. like they were always very, very confident um, in me. And that I think helped a lot. Um, there, there was no questioning, there was no feeling mm -hmm. uh, along the way, like I was trying, that I ever had to sort of keep them happy or they just sort of, once they approved my general, um, view my sort of vision mm -hmm. of the whole thing they really left me alone until i had finished the draft um okay yeah so many of the books in this so that that took a long time uh so the pressure just came from me just wanting to make it <laughs> the best thing possible i mean it's the chance for me the chance of a lifetime chance to work with yeah my hero in a way so um i was how much did you get to um talk to and work with suzanne oh a lot yeah yeah i mean the I spent a day or two with her at the beginning, uh, just interviewing her about everything. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not just his movies and his writing, but just things about him, you know, like yeah. what did he believe about religion or politics or technology and mm -hmm. all that stuff really, really worked into the, um, the structuring and thematics of the book. Um, and also, I found out what was what was his favorite stuff, like what was his favorite mm -hmm. movies, and then that allowed me to study that stuff. You know, if because I couldn't go to him, I yeah. thought, well, if I can just if I can watch, if I can obsess about the art that he obsessed over, maybe I can start to be inspired by the things that inspired him. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of an odd way to go about it, but it, it really paid off. Yeah, because eventually when I studied some of these texts that he was obsessed with, uh, two or three times, I did figure it out. Like I saw, oh, I get it. This is I see now how this influenced his films. Uh -huh. And then I was able to sort of take that. And sometimes it was something small in the script. Sometimes it was a character part in the book. Uh, but sometimes it was huge architectural ideas like, OK, so this his opera he's obsessed with, I could use that as a structural scaffolding to build mm -hmm. the, the sort of three act structure of the book. So that it was, it was um, a weird, unusual process that was fascinating and I hope never to do it again because <laughs> it was so complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So you come up on sort of all these things that he left behind and then it's kind of like, where do you start to feel like you can put your own stamp on that like how did you decide like okay well this is how i'm you know putting myself into this book while kind of still staying true to what he would have wanted yeah there were there was never enough of his material there that it was ever going to be able to be just by george Romero. you know mm -hmm. the work i was doing was far more significant than that so it was always it was always at the end of the day not going to be a george Romero book it was mm -hmm. going to be a romero Krauss book there was no way around that there, yeah. were too much, there was too much missing. <laughs> so, um, so I had no choice but to put a lot of myself into it. Now, I would say that, you know, on looking at it from afar, we I was sort of born of George Romero, so we're not we're not far apart in mm -hmm. sort of our thoughts in politics and um, just general philosophies. We're sort of already sort of copacetic. Um, but inevitably I have my own obsessions and he has mm -hmm. it and those were how it's going to have to be married when I could, if I came to a crossroads and I didn't know which way to go, I did try to go his way whenever possible, yeah. um, defer to him. You know, there are definitely, uh, elements of the book that are a little more George than they are me. Like I would have made maybe a slightly different choice, but, um, but but sometimes I did make a different choice and there are things of his I had to cut out uh, and I hated doing that because mm -hmm. there's a finite amount of his stuff but there were times when all of these pieces were put together that there were you know two or three bits that no longer functioned in a way that felt uh, conducive to the whole so yeah um, 
So there were like painful moments like that, you know, that, like there's a couple sequences that I really liked that um, I just couldn't. And I know, boy, I did acrobatics to, to fit everything in. <laughs> but there were a couple that I, I just couldn't. Yeah, yeah. So as far as like his take on zombies and his portrayal on zombies, do you think that's kind of how you, if you were to have started just from scratch, working in your own zombie book, is that how you would have approached it? Or do you think you would have had a different approach to sort of the idea of zombies? And Well, first of all, I never would have done it. I'll mm -hmm. still answer your question. Yeah. But I never had <laughs> any intention of writing a zombie book. You know, my mm -hmm. love of George really wasn't based on zombies. Like, mm -hmm. I was a George Romero fan, not a zombie fan. Yeah. Um, I had a problem with zombies. I like zombies as much as the next guy. But I was, I was uh, an acolyte of his mm -hmm. entire work. And yeah, he made six zombie movies, but he made more movies that weren't zombie yeah. movies. And those I studied just as hard and mm -hmm. researched just as hard for this book. Um, so, you know, Romero led to the zombie, the sort of popular culture zombie uprising. And I, I think I was so happy with his, mm -hmm. his films that I never really thought um, that I would ever approach the genre at all. Yeah. Um, except for this one impossibility. You would ask me, I said, well, yeah, if I could work with George, maybe I'd do it. Um, so I wouldn't have done it. Um, but I think if you, the average person though, I think would, would not take this approach either. I think today, mm -hmm. if you're going to write a zombie book um, or make a zombie movie or anything, you're, you're probably going to want a new, a completely new angle on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And George wasn't interested in that. He, you yeah. know, he came up with this, he came up with the zombie. He's not going to, come up with some new angle where they fly or have laser beams or something <laughs> you know this is his thing and so that's what i really liked about the living dead was it it was not going to offer you any new bells and whistles yeah it was just going to be a straight up zombie story to end all of them and have and more importantly uh finish his thought mm -hmm. you know because i had we had these six zombie movies i mean various writings and interviews and his zombie movies as is explained in the books um end note author's note uh they're not in chronological order so i had to figure out what the chronology really was of his movies they're all messed up yeah um, and that allowed me to sort of start to once i understood the chronology mm -hmm. which nobody i don't think had ever really figured out um once you figure out where the arc is going you can start to understand where it might end and uh, my, my, from what I took from his, mm -hmm. his leavings, his notes, uh, this was intended to be an end. So I had to figure out, all right, if we know points A, B, C, D, E, F, what's mm -hmm. G and H? Can, can, can we intuit what those are once we have the, this information? Um, and I guess another writer would maybe have interpreted it differently, but yeah, uh, I feel really good about my interpretation and for anyone who wants to fight me about it, the, the author's <laughs> note goes into extended detail about why I made the decisions I did. So you yeah. can get a full uh, sense of at least my thinking behind it. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, going into it, thinking like it's going to be a losing battle probably makes it a better, you know, probably made the process easier and made the product kind of better because you weren't so concerned about expectations other than from the estate so just like yeah i mean no one no one could put any more pressure on me than i could so mm -hmm. all the, the the pressure that would have existed external to me uh felt insignificant yeah you yeah know? like this was something i've been training for my entire almost my entire life mm -hmm. maybe not the first four years of my life but yeah. everything <laughs> after yeah. so like i had a lot to say i've been thinking about george's films for 40 years mm -hmm. Uh, so, and you mentioned, yeah. I was gonna say, you mentioned his other films and really appreciating his other films that are not his zombie films. So if there's a George Romero film um, that you think not enough people know about or appreciate, you know, what is your favorite one that you would like more people to appreciate? There's, there's several. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, his probably my next favorite of his is probably also one of his most well-known uh, mm -hmm. creep show. So yes. That's, Everyone knows, knows Creep Show and loves Creep Show. It's easily available. If you haven't seen it, I don't know. Well, it's spectacular. Know why you're yeah. listening to this? <laughs> um, but sort of his lesser scene. Uh, he he's got a, a film called Martin, which is um, 
my my favorite like vampire movie of all time. Uh-huh. Uh, it's it's many sort of for the people who are really into Romero. It's a lot of Romero Files favorite Romero movie. Um, it's sort of this perfect piece of like seventies indie film. Uh, it is almost impossible to see right now um, because the rights are weird. Uh, so it's not available in America at all. It's not even a DVD. Ah. Um, you can buy a used DVD, but it's going to be really expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one is just unavailable. So I hate to say Martin because you can't see it. Um, but I mean, he's got so many good ones. Um, his his third movie, Season of the Witch, which is pretty available mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. Uh, is wonderful. Um his final movie, Survival of the Dead, which a lot of people haven't seen. Um, his final movie was also a, a zombie film. Uh, I love that movie. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of in the minority on that one, but I, I think it's just, I think it's sort of a quiet little masterpiece. Yeah, nice, nice. So I have to ask you, of course, about the pandemic. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> because, right, you spend all this time working on this novel about, you know, a, a plague infecting humanity and then 2020 hits and it comes out during this time when, you know, this pandemic is infecting humanity. So I, I'm curious to know, you know, what that felt like and sort of, um, you know, what parallels you maybe draw. Oh, I mean, there's tons. I mean, yeah. 2020 was the uh, George Romero world. Like mm-hmm. that, that was the world he's been warning us about. Um, in his, in his version, it was zombies instead of, um, COVID-19, but, Mm -hmm. but that's not what he was, that's not what he was talking about. He wasn't all that, he was never all that interested in zombies, really. They were just sort of the, the catalyst, you know, what he was writing about were people who couldn't get along and people who couldn't follow simple instructions and people Mm -hmm. who couldn't, who couldn't take, um, who couldn't work together to take simple steps to keep themselves safe. So that, that in a nutshell is 2020, you know, if you can't get people to put on a mask, a little cloth mask, you're not going to, they're not going to be able to, to fight off zombies. Like <laughs> when the zombies come, they're gone. Like we will fall <laughs> apart in rapid order, you know, according to George, that's what he always said. And, uh-huh. you know, you watch like, like day of the dead and it's, I mm-hmm. think it's that five years after the zombie uprising and there's just like almost no more people and you're like how is that possible that that's ridiculous <laughs> it's not ridiculous at all now we know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. uh so it was weird there are a lot of things in the book that all mm-hmm. came true in 2020 um but that's sort of par for the course for Romero he was always yeah one step ahead of what was happening in society mm-hmm. he was very much a sort of prognosticator mystic yeah. most of, yeah. of what was going to happen what was going to go wrong in America next? <laughs> oh, we'll have to wait and see. Does it get worse? We <laughs> <laughs> haven't um, found that, that part of a new book yet. That's right. <laughs> so I have to ask, um, what has the response been like from Romero fans that you that you know of? <laughs> I mean, well, it's been great. It's yeah. just been fantastic. Um, I, you know, I think, I believe Living Dead is my 10th book. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, I've ever had a, a reception like it. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it, it meant, I think, you know, and this, this plays out, I think in other books in my career and I probably in a lot of writers careers. Um, it, when you just are writing something for yourself, you know, and this really was something where, again, I was not thinking beyond, you know, I mean, I was thinking about it. I wanted, I would do something that George would be proud of, but you know, I was, I'm going to sit here and write an 800 page book and I'm going to put everything and every thought I have into it and all my heart. And, um, and those are the ones that no matter what the topics are that seem to connect, like you can feel it, you know, like uh, it, it almost doesn't matter what the topic is. Um, yeah. That sometimes when you just, I think when your heart is in it in a strange way, people can kind of pick up on that. Yeah. So, the, so the feedback has been tr- tremendous. You know, I, I didn't get to commune with him. Of course, we had this <laughs> huge tour planned. We were going to go all around the, the country and uh, maybe out of the country uh-huh. and all that got scuttled, of course. Uh, so I've had very little opportunity to um, talk 
in person, but tons of people yeah. have reached out and um, it's been just a wonderful, wonderful experience from, yeah. from the whole thing has been just a dream. Yeah. How is, yeah, so how has the kind of COVID-19 pandemic been for you as an author and do you see any sort of like, you know, pros that have come out of it? Well, I don't, it, you know, it hasn't affected me as a writer as much, I think, as it affected a lot of other writers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest like palpable effect was I had 2020 as just happenstance. I had, I had four books come out in 2020, which is uh, a lot. And yeah. Normally you want maybe one, but I had four books that they were all different audiences. So somehow they were all able to play together. And that was unfortunate in some ways. Um, none of the, you know, that none of them got a kind of release that it, it should have. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's a small complaint in the larger scope of things. As far as like on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it didn't affect me too much. I'm pretty good. At, I mean, if I have one superpower, it's focusing. <laughs> uh, so I can, I can pretty, pretty well block off what's happening in the world uh -huh. for the, the eight hours that I'm working uh, per day. And I, that, that's basically how it worked, just like nine to five. Um, and I don't, I, I hardly went anywhere before <laughs> the pandemic. Uh, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but it really isn't. Like I really do sit here at this exact place where I'm sitting right now and work. Uh, it used to be seven days a week for many, many years. And then mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I started taking off Sundays. Um, and it's, and I don't even like that. It's still, yeah. Sundays are a struggle. Uh, <laughs> But you know, so so it didn't change that. I'm still sitting here. I've still been sitting here, uh, working the same amount of hours and getting about the same amount done. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing I read was that right that there were sort of additional stories that Romero left behind, unfinished stories, or and so I'm, I'm curious, right? Like, kind of um, if there is more stuff, what your hope is for that in the future? Well, I mean, probably talking about his archives, mm -hmm. um, which uh are have been acquired were had had been acquired by the university of pittsburgh um and now they've all been logged they're not really accessible yet because you, you have to kind of go to the university of pittsburgh to use them so mm -hmm. we're still in pandemic time so yeah. you can't really access them yeah <laughs> in any kind of serious way but they're all there and you can go online to like a finder tool and you can see them all um well, you can see what they are and so, and, I, and I've seen those archives in person before the pandemic. Um, and yeah, there's tons of stuff. Um, not, not so much uh, stories and books, but there's, there's just hundreds of uh, screenplays and treatments mm -hmm. and um, partial screenplays. Yeah. I mean, just 50 years of it. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of output. So I guess the question is, will some of that, um, will some of it get made? Will some, will there be other things like the living dead where somebody mm -hmm. takes an old George Romero script and actually produces it? I think the answer inevitably will be yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know that it's happened yet. Um, mm -hmm. Just because they've largely been inaccessible up to this point. Um, but it seems, it, but it seems inevitable. I think at some point someone's gonna um, gonna jump on this, and it'll be bittersweet because a mm -hmm. hallmark of George's career was that he could never get anything made. Um, you know, you look at this body of work he's got in there, and it's hundreds of stories, hundreds yeah. of scripts, uh, and you know, in the last probably twenty years of his career, or something he couldn't get anything made that wasn't a zombie film, mm -hmm. so he couldn't even get like a horror film made. You know, like he was in so small of a corner that he could only make zombie films. That's a really small niche. And he was mm -hmm. grateful for that and everything. But when you look at her, his, his archives, it's got, you know, Westerns and sci-fis and all these things, other things that he wanted to do. Um, so I don't, I, again, I expect those, those things to be largely mm -hmm. ignored. And yeah. people will focus on the horror because that's just sort of where the name is. But um, but yeah, sort of my dream, I guess, is that somebody would uh, make one of his non-horror things. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of yeah. like when people started making movies of Stephen King's non 
horror. Like when they made Stand By Me and mm-hmm. Josh Yank Redemption, they started, they started saying, okay, we'll look at some of your other stuff. I would like that to happen with George because he, he, he was passionate about other genres. Yeah. Um, more passionate, I think. You know, mm-hmm. he was not a horror fan really in, in yeah. his adulthood. He'd never watched or read horror. Um, and I think that's what made him such a great horror storyteller actually. Because mm-hmm. he wasn't echoing other things he was seeing. He was using, he was, had been forced to use horror to tell other stories. And I think that made them all the more interesting. Yeah. Well, and hopefully, you know, even if he is known for zombies, for horror, hopefully that brings people to him and then they get interested enough to then explore the other things, sort of like you did, right? You had your yeah. introduction through Night of the Living Dead, but then you thought, oh, I wonder what else is out there. So, you know, hopefully it finds an audience that way at least yeah, yeah i think it will i mean talk about his weird uh other movies that people haven't seen he did direct a few non-horror including this wacko one called night riders <laughs> that's um it's a retelling of king arthur but the, all the characters are these like renaissance fair jousters but instead of horses they're on motorcycles <laughs> it's the weirdest like setup scenario i could ever imagine um, and it was one of his favorite movies that he made. It's um, and it's relatively newly available. Like it's streaming places, so you can actually yeah. see that one and see for yourself. Okay, I have to how, look it how up. far beyond horror he was willing to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you had four books come out in 2020. So I'm curious, what else do you have, sort of like in the pipeline or coming up? I have a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, this right now, I'm on the last few issues of got it here uh i i'm writing this comic book called the autumnal it's also that poster that's behind me actually. that's right <laughs> uh so that has a couple three more issues so that's a monthly comic um and then one of the books last year was this book called they threw us away which is the first of a trilogy so the second one of that will come out at the end of this year and then the third one the year after that and then I've got a bunch of other stuff. I'm looking this way because that's my little project list. Um, <laughs> none of which has been announced, but um, but I, I can say that there's uh, adult stuff, YA stuff, middle grade stuff, more comic stuff, a graphic novel. Um, so I, again, it, it's kind of really spanning the um, mediums and uh, age ranges as you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, everyone's wondering sort of what people are doing during the pandemic. So what have you been reading or watching that you've really enjoyed? Mm. Mm. <laughs> See, this is, this is the one question that I always wish I knew was coming in advance. Um, Cause I've, I've, I've watched a ton. I don't really watch TV shows. I'm not a TV yeah. show watcher. I'm not a binger, um, but I've watched just ridiculous amounts of movies um but i just I, I'm, I'm caught off guard i don't you know, and i've read, read a bunch of books um my favorite book of last year of 2020 was a book called the seventh mansion by a writer named maurice meyer um so that's a book maybe you haven't heard of that i i really mm-hmm. loved um and movies god i don't even know where to start you know, there's a movie that came out in 2020 that um, everyone hated called Capone. It was about mm-hmm. Al Capone in his later years. Um, and I just think it's an incredible film. No one went to see it. Everyone hated it. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, but that's, those are my favorite kind of finds. Like, yeah, I think everyone is wrong. Like, I think that movie is just amazing. And so, and that's available everywhere. That, that was a, a big budget flop. So you can find it anywhere you want. Yeah, I think pe- I usually like to think that people are just missing something that I'm just so astute that I'm not missing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and I mean, well, what probably happens is somebody is given. And this is certainly the case in Capone. Someone is given a big budget to make something, and they make some sort of weird personal thing. Yeah, it's it's they've made something that's going to appeal strongly to a tiny little group of people but somebody gave them money for this to reach this group of people. So uh, it's going to be a, once you've done that, it's going to be an enormous financial yeah. <laughs> but 
those two or three <laughs> people who you've accidentally made it for are going to love it. Right. If you've positively affected one person's life, you've done your job. <laughs> yeah, and that was the person that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll wrap up with this uh, final question. So, right, um, you have a newsletter. People can find out more about you and what you have going on. How do people find out more about what you have going on and coming up? Oh, um, yeah, that's probably the best way. Um, so if you go to my website, which is just danielkraus.com and um, click on contact, I think it has all the links one would need to contact. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening and taking the time and we really appreciate it. Uh, anytime uh, you have me on speed dial, anytime you want. <laughs> well, thanks. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Have a good night. All right. Take care.